Uh, well, good morning. It's great to see you guys here. I appreciate you uh, not going out and, uh, you know, being on the bike trails or, you know, it's super nice out today. So thanks for being here. Um, I do want to point out, you know, it may look like you're in a horror movie when you're in the bathroom because the lights are going on and off. That's what I felt like I was in there. Uh, but it's, it's OPBD, power issue. Um, you know, we'll trust the Lord the building's not going to explode. But it's nothing new. Uh, they're aware, but it's clearly not going to get fixed this morning. Um, so uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Today we're going to continue our series on Psalms today. Uh, I'm going to talk about Psalm 19, which is an amazing psalm. You know, in preparing this week, I felt a little bit like what Gary shared last week was that there's so much amazing, awesome stuff in here, I just don't want to screw it up. Uh, so let's take a moment, we'll pray, we'll ask the Lord to speak, and then we'll get started. Lord, we do just thank you for today, we thank you for your word, we thank you for how it speaks. God, your word is amazing, it is awesome. Um, God, help us to respond to it in the right way. Um, Lord, I pray you just help me to say exactly what you want me to say. Help me not to say things you don't. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to talk about Psalm 19, God's revelation and man's response. Uh, as you know, the Psalms are poetry or songs. And so they're a little different than when you read, say, historical portions of the Bible or you know, didactic portions, which might be like Paul's letter, um, they're poems or songs. And so this is what C.S. Lewis said. He said, most emphatically, the Psalms must be read as poems, as lyrics with all the licenses, all the formalities, with hyperboles, uh, the emotional rather than logical connections, which are proper to lyric poetry. He was an expert in poetry and things like that. And he said, this is, this is poetry, this is song. And that means that there are a bunch of literary devices that are used in psalms. And some of those liter literary devices worked really well in Hebrew, but they don't come through as much in English. And they can also make psalms, sometimes you're like, well, why did he say it that way? Why did he say it like four different times in a slightly different way? Well, he's, the, the authors are using literary devices. And so I thought I might just mention a few of those literary devices. And, Sorry if it feels like we're going back to English class, but it is actually, I think, really interesting what is in here. So there's a variety of literary devices. There are actually 16, at least 16 different literary devices. These are just a couple of the more common ones. One is called parallelism. Parallelism is basically expressing the same idea in slightly different ways, or sometimes in contrasting ways, or in complementary ways. And we saw it in Psalms 1, but we're going to see it a bunch today in Psalm 19. Another common literary device is a chiasm, which means a cross over. And so that might be like A, B, C, and then it works back C, B, A. And it's sort of like, you know, songs that were like A, B, A, B, refrain, chorus, anyway. But it's the same thing sort of with poetry. And so Psalm 19.1 is a good example. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. and say heaven, sky, except you'd be like, well, it's A, B, C, A, B, C. Well, if you're reading the original Hebrew, what it actually says is that uh, the heavens declare the glory of God, the works of his hands proclaim the skies. Now, in English, we don't write it that way because you'd be like, what? And so it gets translated that way, but that uh, literary device is there. Um, and that's in a whole bunch of psalms. Another literary device that you'll encounter is called an acrostic, which is basically where each line or each stanza starts with a different letter of the alphabet. Psalm 119 is an example of this. Actually, the Proverbs 31 woman description is an acrostic. There are alliterations where every word, like a number of words start with the same sound, or assonance where the same sound is in each word but not at the beginning. Now, that definitely gets lost usually in English, but sometimes you'll see it come out. And then there's hyperbole. And hyperbole is something that we use commonly in our speech. Um, and, and what it is, is, is it's an exaggeration to create a picture in the mind that's not actual literal, literal. So Psalm 40, he says, my troubles are without number, my sins have overtaken me, and I can't see. Now that doesn't mean he's literally blind. It means that everything is so terrible on top of him, he doesn't know what to do. But he's building this picture in your mind of how difficult his circumstances are. And so Psalms uses that sort of language. All right. But it uses that language, I think. And, and to understand some of this, it really does give us um, uh, 
I think, a greater appreciation of psalms, of what an amazingly complex, beautiful, penetrating, and inspiring words they are. So let's move on and talk about Psalm 19. Psalm 19, David is the author. Now, we don't know when he wrote it or under what circumstances, like we do some of the other psalms. Uh, we do know he wrote the whole thing. Now, did he write the whole thing all at once, or did he write part of it and the other part of it and say, well, I'm going to put these two together because I think they fit well? We don't know that. He may have. He may have written the whole thing all together. Uh, C.S. Lewis, again, to quote him, said, I take this to be the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. Now, coming from what I think is one of the greatest writers in the last hundred years, that's pretty high praise. Psalm 19 is considered a wisdom psalm. There's a variety of different types of psalms, but it's a wisdom psalm, just like Psalm 1 was. Uh, to outline the psalm, it begins in the first 11 verses of God revealing himself. And it starts off in the first six, and it talks about how God reveals himself in his creation. And then in verses 7 through 11, about how he reveals himself specifically through his word. And then it finishes in the last three verses with man's response to God's revelation, and that's the outline we're going to use. Um, so let's read. I, I want to read the whole psalm, and then we'll kind of come back through it verse by verse. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. In them he has set a tent for the sun. There is no speech. There is no words. There is uh, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. It, I think I stuck an extra phrase in there. In them he has sent a tent in the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs his course in joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise is simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure. You're seeing this parallelism here, right here. Enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his error? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's a lot. So Psalm 19 begins with David declaring that God has revealed himself through his creation through what everyone can see and experience. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. When he speaks of heavens and sky, what he's talking about is all that stuff up there we see, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything that's going on above us. And he says these works of God, what we see reveals things about the creator, what our creator thinks, what he's like, the kind of creator he is. And I want to illustrate that the creation reveals something about the creator. And I want to do it using, using art, because that helps us. So this is a famous painting by Jackson Pollock. Uh, he is a famous uh, abstract expressionist. And the way he painted is he would throw art at the canvas. He would actually put them on the floor, and he would just throw the paint at it until he felt like it was done. Now, when you look at this, it's communicating something. It doesn't have structure or order. It doesn't seem to have purpose. It communicates energy. It's interesting to look at. But it communicates his philosophy of art and life, that life doesn't have a lot of meaning. There's energy expended. It's interesting. But that's about all there is. And that would, I think, fit with his philosophy. So you can learn something about him. Now, this is a different painting. This is by Rembrandt, who's considered one of the greatest artists uh, in history. This is the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Now, you can see this is a very different painting. It has structure. It communicates a story. You look at it, and you say, what is going on here? I'm very interested. Why are these guys out on the ocean? Who are these guys? What's going on? 
it clearly comes from a different philosophical and belief standpoint than that previous picture. And so you can see them just in the contrast. There's definitely a different philosophy and belief, and we can learn things about the artist just by looking at them, generally, just as we can about God when we look at his creation. And that's what David is saying. He's saying, listen, we look at all this stuff, and we, we see it declares the glory of God. It proclaims his handiwork. He clearly created it. Now, David, if you remember, he was a shepherd, right? And shepherds didn't live in houses back then. They tended to hang out with the sheep. And so he spent a lot of nights probably sitting out under a sky. Uh, oh, we got that slide. We can't. Uh, like this. Okay? This is the Milky Way. You can, if you go somewhere where there's not a lot of light, so not Omaha, uh, and you are, your eyes get adjusted. It takes about half an hour, 40 minutes for your, your eyes to become fully sensitive. You could see something like this with your eyeballs. And David probably saw this. Uh, David also spent a lot of time running from Saul, right? And so, again, a lot of time hanging out in the wilderness. And I think this is what he was thinking about when he talked about this. And, and that is the Milky Way galaxy, which looks really impressive from Earth, but we now know it's about 200,000 light years across and has between 100 and 400 billion stars. And so when we look up there, you know, that's what David was experiencing. And, and you know, so that's what he could see, but, you know, we actually know more. We've seen more. And so, you know, I want to show you another picture. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. What they did to get this picture was just pointed the Hubble telescope at a really dark spot where there was nothing. And this is what they saw. Not stars, 10,000 galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars her galaxy, the heavens declare the glory of God. They proclaim his handiwork. And if that wasn't enough, it turns out not only is like the universe amazingly vast and impressive, it's highly tuned. There's actually something called the anthropomorphic principle, which basically says the entire universe seems to be built in a way that would support life. Uh, all the forces, masses, distances, pretty much everything is made so that it can support life. And if they were all slightly different, we wouldn't exist. An example, I could give you 30 examples, but I'll give you one. The electromagnetic coupling constant, which binds electrons to protons. Some of you are like, I haven't heard that in 30. Don't talk to me about it. But electrons and protons, right? Those are the atoms that make up, uh, make up everything. If that force was slightly stronger, those electrons would be held on too tightly. If it was slightly weaker, They'd be too loose, and we couldn't have chemical bonding, which everything in our universe runs on chemistry. I don't know if you know this, but you run on chemistry. And if our atoms were just slightly different, we would not exist. Just slightly. And that's one of the forces that underlies everything that goes on in our universe. And I could give you a hundred examples like that, whether you look on the macro level like this, or you look in the microscopic level, I don't know if you know this, but there are bacteria out there that have compasses. They literally have iron in them that they can align with magnetic fields. These are bacteria. And wherever you look, physics, chemistry, doesn't matter, it clearly proclaims that we are not here by accident. We were created by some sort of hyper-intelligent, amazing being. And it's only in modern times We've chosen to reject the idea of a creator and replace it with our God of time, and we got really lucky because that's what we replaced our God with. It's a really long time, and we're lucky. Not to call evolutionary theory down to one statement, but that's pretty much it. Let's go to verse 2. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. So David talks about the heavens, and he says they're speaking day to day and night to night. And basically what that's saying is it's a nice poetic way of saying it's talking all the time. It's constantly speaking. It's making the knowledge of God plain. And the verb here for pours out would be like a spring bubbling out. What we see is constantly pointing out, hey, there's a God. Hey, there's something bigger than you. Look, you can't miss it. It's speaking all the time. You did not get here by random chance. And so we experience that, not just when you look at a starry sky, but when you look at a mountain, you're like, man, that's an amazing mountain. Or you look at the farmland of Nebraska. We were out at uh, Fontenot Forest on Friday. 
beautiful, amazing, complex. Even when you hold a baby, all these experiences of beauty and majesty were imbued with those things by our creator, and they are unexplainable. Now, what does this speech speak of? What can we learn about God from his creation? Well, we can learn some things, and this is the idea of general revelation. God has, um, we can learn some things about God through observing nature, through his influence on history, through our inner experience, and that's different than special revelation, which is what we're going to talk about in verses 7 through 11, which is God specifically saying specific things to specific people, which is why it's special. Maybe it'd be called specific revelation. Um, so what can we learn about God? Well, I think we can clearly see that God is amazingly intelligent and powerful. That's really obvious. And the God who created such majesty, he must be really majestic. And he must be really awesome. He's also a really creative God, right? He created amazing things. And, you know, he's a God who clearly cares about us, wants to meet our needs. He's put so much on our world that can provide for us. And we found different ways. It's like he's laid things out so, oh, now we can use this, and now we can use that. And, yeah, we developed some new technology, but who put the resources on the earth for us to use? It was God. All right, verse 3. There is no speech, or no wor uh, nor are there words whose, uh, words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out to all the world, and their words to the end of the world. In verse 3 and 4, it's made clear this speech, this revelation, this understanding of God goes out everywhere to the entire earth. No one misses out on it. Everybody can see it. Everyone experiences it. No matter where you live or when you live, God's general revelation about him reaches you. Now, because it reaches everyone, actually means we all have the opportunity to respond to God or to not respond to God. And Paul speaks about this, actually, in Romans. He talks about general revelation, actually, in Romans. This is what he says in Romans 1. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. He's speaking about people. He's saying God is obvious. People can't make excuses for not seeing him. He can't be missed unless we choose to deliberately miss him. And God has revealed himself not only through creation, but he's actually revealed himself through the conscience that he's put in us. In uh, chapter 2, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they don't have the law. Paul says the Gentiles like do some of the things the law says. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse and even excuse them. Even the Gentiles who didn't have the Jewish law had their conscience. God had written things on their heart and convicted them of wrongdoing. And so we see in these two passages that God and, and knowledge about him are obvious to all men. And because of this, people are accountable to God. No one is excluded. And because of this, everyone is accountable. Then we move on to verse 5 and 6 here. And he has this picture of the sun coming out. Uh, and the psalm focuses on the sun. And you know what's unique about the sun is nothing escapes it. Everything in our universe, everything in our world is dependent on the sun. If the sun went out, we'd all be dead within a week. Because everything runs on the sun. And, you know, I think it's really amazing that God would choose to reveal himself. Now, God doesn't want to remain hidden. He wants us to come to know him, to understand him, to realize what he's created. But there's more to learn than just what generally we can learn from his creation. And that's what's in verse 7 to 11. And this is where God reveals himself through his word. And this is what we call special revelation. This isn't the creation. This is God's manifestation of himself to particular persons at definite times and places, enabling the person to enter into a redemptive relationship with him. So this would be like God speaking to Noah, God speaking to Abraham, God speaking to Moses, God speaking to the prophets, God speaking to David, God speaking to us through Jesus, through his words and deeds. And all of those are captured in this book. And so this is God's special revelation. 
we can learn a lot more about God through this than we can through creation. We can learn some things, but we learn much better through this book because God has clearly and specifically cre uh, communicated to us. And we needed that because sin had kind of wrecked that relationship with God, right? And we couldn't really learn things, and we misinterpreted them, and we didn't understand them very well because our relationship with God was wrecked by sin. So let's move on, and we're going to cover uh, the next verses. So I'm not going to read this, but what I'll point out to you, I'll put it up here because we already read it. The first thing you may notice, and maybe you didn't notice, but the, the word for God changes. In those first six verses, he was talking about God, which is the Hebrew word El, which is sort of like the most generic, general form of God. It's the word that's used when it talks about God creating. In verse 7, he switches to the Lord, and it's in capital letters, and it may be in little capital letters in your Bible. And what that means is the term being used there is the Hebrew term for the relational, personal God, generally called Yahweh. And I think this switch is very purposeful by David. We have the general God that we can know about through his creation, but we have the personal God who's revealed himself to us through his word and who we can come to know and have a relationship with. In this verse, there's a lot of parallelisms uh, that are used artistically to highlight how wonderful and beautiful God's word is. And he lays out six aspects of God's word, and then he attributes six characteristics to them, and then gives six benefits or impacts of them. And because, again, I like tables, I put them into a table to help us better understand them rather than work through them verse by verse. And so these are the words he uses. The first term he talks about is he talks about God's law. And, and so this is the term like Torah, uh, his instruction. It's the same term that we saw in, he, in Psalms 1 where it said, but his delight is in the law or the instruction of the Lord. And, and this isn't just a traditional law like you might think about it, like the Ten Commandments. This term really encompasses everything that God has covered, all of his revelation. To the people. So everything that God had given them would be encompassed in his law. Then it talks about his testimony or his witness. Uh, his word is his witness, specifically his witness about himself and what we need to know about him. Then it talks about his precepts and his commandments. And these would be like his orders, his rules, his law. And then it mentions the fear of the Lord, which it's not technically God's word, but it's an attitude towards God's word that takes God's word seriously and puts it into practice. And then he talks about his rules or his ordinances. And if this seems repetitive, it is a little repetitive. But again, this is poetry. It's trying to make a point and draw a picture of, hey, everything that God has said is encompassed in this. I'm not leaving any of it out. It all is here. And we can't take like parts that we want and like and like, not like parts we don't like. We're like, I, yeah, I don't think I like that part. I'm just going to ignore that. That's not how God's at. What he's saying is we have to take it all, all of it, and take it seriously and listen to it. All right, let's move on and look at the, oh, I went too far, too far, giving things away. All right, let's look at the descriptors. The first descriptor uses perfect. Now, this isn't just like perfect like it's without error. It's complete. That's the idea of this word. It's complete. It's not It's fully adequate. Nothing is missing. All we need to know is revealed in God's word, and nothing more is needed. Now, it also supports that the Bible is without error or completely truthful in all it teaches. Next, it says the testimonies are sure. Uh, that means they're reliable. We can be confident in them. We don't like have to worry about what they mean. We can put our trust in God that what he says is true and correct. Next, his precepts are right. His precepts are right. They're without error. Uh, we hear over and over, at least I do, how the Bible is in error. It's mistaken. It's antiquated. It's incorrect. You know, the Bible makes a really strong case for it that, is, that it is not in error, and it is always correct in all it commands. Next, we see that the commandments are pure. They are without stain or blemish. They are morally correct. They are without sin. They're also pure, can also be like clear. Like, it's not confusing. God says, do not lie. That's not confusing at all. That's really simple. 
Um, then it talks about the fear of the Lord being clean, without spot or blemish. And then finally, the rules or ordinances. And at the end here, he like gives two descriptors, and then he's actually going to give two benefits in this last one. Um, maybe he didn't want to write a seventh line. I don't know. I couldn't find something to fit lyrically. Uh, he's an artist. You know, they, they take license. That's all right. Um, but they're true. They're in line with reality. Uh, they're with, in line with how the creator has designed things. So we talked about how following God's methods for our marriage, our parenting, how we handle our emotions, deal with conflict, and generally living our life is beneficial. And it's beneficial because our creator God knows the best way for us to live. He knows the way we should live. And this is what it says in James. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, be no hearer who forgets, but the doer acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Putting into practice what God has said is going to bless our lives. That's it's what God says. If we do what he says, if we live the way he says, we will be blessed, both in this life and in the life to come. And I think that's a good place to move on to the benefits, the effect of God's word. First thing he says is God's law, his word, his instruction that's perfect revives the soul. It brings life to the soul. It says in Ephesians 2, we just covered this a couple months ago, we are born spiritually dead. We have no relationship with God, but we hear the gospel. We hear God's word. And we're born again through his word. 1 Peter 1.23 says, since you've been born again, not by perishable seed, but by imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. We're born again. We're spiritually revived through God's word. It brings spiritual rebirth. But even after we're saved, God's word brings revival and renewal. I know many times I've been frustrated, discouraged, upset, disappointed. And I go to God's word, and he revives my soul. He encourages me. He lifts up my downcast face. Then we see his testimonies. Make the wise simple. We talked about this last summer in Proverbs. The whole book of Proverbs is centered around taking the simple and making them wise. Taking the open-minded and who's influenced by everything and everyone and making him wise to the correct path. And that's what God's word will do. Next it says his precepts rejoice the heart. God's word obeyed brings joy. We talked about that in James. There's a joy in following God's path. We were uh, on a vacation a couple weeks ago, and we were just talking about, like, vacations and doing things together, and some people, some people don't do things with their family. We like doing things with our family. We're talking about why do we like doing things with our family. Well, we enjoy being with our family. And I, I think the reason we enjoy being, this is what we're telling our kids, the reason we enjoy being with our family is, we have put into practice at least some or tried to put into practice some of what God has taught us. And because of that, he has brought joy to our relationships where we like being together. And we have fun when we're together. And we want to spend more time together. Next, it says his commandment that's pure enlightens the eyes. It's like a light shining out into the darkness to give us direction where we should go. So we won't trip and fall on our face. Psalm 119 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Then it says, God's word, his fear of the Lord, it endures forever. That means God's word will not pass away. You know, Jesus said this too. He said, heaven and earth will, will pass away. So everything we see is going to go away. But my words will not pass away. So we can be confident that God's word isn't going to fail. And then finally, again, his rules in order that are true and righteous, there are two benefits here. The servants are warned, and we get great reward. You know, the Bible, God's word is actually filled with warnings. I was thinking about this. It's lots of warnings. Uh, for example, Jesus said there are two paths. One's wide and easy, but it leads to destruction. One's narrow, not so easy, but it leads to eternal life. That was Jesus' warning. There's so many warnings. I think we should talk about the warnings in God's word. That'd be an interesting series to talk about. But God provides warnings that we should heed. But God also provides war rewards when we listen. And we're blessed when we obey, just like we talked about in James.
I'm done with my table. This paints an amazing picture, and you may have noticed I left out verse 10. Well, verse 10 is kind of an aside that he like just sticks in there while he's talking about God's word. It says, more to be desired than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. So it's kind of a caveat, and David says, hey, you should desire this more than gold, which is pretty much the most valuable substance you could think of. Uh, Jesus used the same picture when he talked about the guy who found the buried treasure in the field. He said the kingdom of heaven is like a guy who found a buried treasure in a field. What did he do? He sold everything he had and bought the field. It has enormous value. God's word is more valuable than any substance you could imagine. And it's sweeter than honey, which, you know, you couldn't go buy a pound of sugar back then, right? They, they didn't have sugar back then. So you had to have honey. That was like your only sweetener. And so we're told God's word is better than money, and it's better than honey, which is a nice alliteration there. Or is it an assonance, I think, actually would be what it is. The English people will correct me later. Um, but what it means is we should value it and pursue it and treasure it the same way we do riches. And we should savor it and delight in it the same way we would the most amazing food we can imagine. So hopefully this makes clear God's word is amazing. And, and it's really sufficient to accomplish all of his purposes for our lives, to provide everything we need. We don't actually need God's word plus. We don't need God's word plus new revelation. That's what Mormonism is and Jehovah Witness. It's God's word plus some extra stuff. We don't need God's word plus the tools of psychology. We don't need God's word plus mysticism or mystical experiences. God's word is sufficient to accomplish all of his purposes. It's sufficient to accomplish his, our salvation and our sanctification. This is what uh, Paul wrote in Timothy. And how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So Paul says, Timothy, God's word was sufficient to help you get saved. It was sufficient to bring about salvation. We are saved through God's word. It's also sufficient to bring about our sanctification, which is our righteous and holy living. Because he goes on in 16, he says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, for training, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. God's word is what we need to equip us to accomplish what he wants us to do. It is sufficient. And it's also sufficient to overcome our struggles and our difficulties. He is able through his word to overcome all sin, all hurts, all difficulties we encounter. God's word is sufficient for our victory. So what it says in 2 Corinthians is God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times you may abound in every good work. And so it seems that that passage, and I may be going out on a limb here, says we have all we need. Because it does say all four times. And then it says every. And so... Um, God's word is adequate to accomplish every task that he wants to accomplish. And God's word applied to our heart gives us abounding grace. And it's the tool that's going to help us to stop sinning, to love people more, to overcome our hurts. And there's no more useful tool than God's word because he divinely empowers it. Other, now, I don't want to say other tools aren't useful, right? There are great Christian books, there's good Christian counseling, there's good advice from other people. There's lots of other tools we have, but I think these tools are most effective when they remind us what has God said, they help us better understand what God has said, or they help us better apply what God has said. And if the tools we're trying to use don't do that, I would not expect them to be helpful. The other thing is, if we aren't like reading this, and I feel like I say this a lot, if you aren't taking it in, it's not going to be very helpful. It's not going to change anything if we don't take it in. So we need to be reading God's word. If you aren't reading God's word, you are leaving God's power on the table. You are missing out on God's work to grow and to change you. It's just that simple. God is going to work through his word in your heart and your mind. And if we don't take it in, can't do that. All right, let's move on to verse 12 through 14. 
Uh, this finishes with some perspective. Uh, David shares all this about God, God's creation, what we can learn about him, God's word, his amazing word. And then he, and then he sort of steps back and he's like, Ugh, boy, God, when I look at that, the way I see myself, probably not the way I saw myself when I started out. Um, and it helps us to have the right perspective when we read this passage. This is what David said. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless the innocent and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In view of God's perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, true, and righteous law, it's very appropriately to correctly recognize that we are, we are inadequate. We, we just don't measure up to God's standards. We are sinful. We agree with what Solomon says. In Ecclesiastes, kind of a bleak statement. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they die. This is a sort of bleak, um, but if we look in our own heart, we see sin and failure. And that's what David did. He looked at God's perfect law and he said, boy, man, Lord, I am inadequate. You know, and I think as we grow to understand God's word, we grow, frankly, I think you're going to grow in your inadequacy. You're going to understand better that you don't measure up. It was easy when I was young to think, well, I kind of got things together. I got, I'm pretty good. I do not think that way. I am woefully inadequate. And it is God's word that is going to help us to understand that we don't measure up. Uh, and David's response when he sees this, he prays. And he prays that God would protect him from sin, from two types of sin. And that would be a very appropriate thing to pray. He asks God to help him. He prays first that God would keep him from hidden sin. What are hidden sins? Well, some sins are hidden from us. We don't even know that we're doing something that's sinful or wrong or offensive to God. Uh, and there are other sins, though, that I think um, that we realize are sin, but we we like to keep them hidden. There are sins that you can keep hidden that uh, maybe we, you know, would, we just don't want to talk about them or we're ashamed of them. And they might include things like lust or discontentment, unthankfulness, envy, Bitterness, pride, or fear, those can all be in your heart. People can't, can't see those things. But to have those fill your heart or to participate in those, is it's sin against God. He's commanded us not to do those things. And while we can hide them, I can hide them, they're obvious to God, and we need to repent from them. The, you know, the wonderful thing about God's word is he's going to use it even if we don't realize we're doing this, to reveal it to us. That's what he says in Hebrews 4. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word is going to help point these things out, and God's word is going to help us root them out and overcome them. Then he prays to be protected from presumptuous sin. Well, what are presumptuous sins? Well, they're obvious sins where I'm like, I know what I should do, but I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to do what I want. Uh, and David says, Lord, protect me from that, because that, if I participate in that, will lead to great transgression. It will lead to great trouble. It's kind of what Paul talks about in Romans 1, where if we continue to choose to disregard what God says, he will give us over to what we want to do. And as we continue to reject and disobey what, what we know God wants us to do, our conscience becomes scarred, and it stops bothering us anymore. And so David prays, Lord, don't let me do those. Don't let there be a pattern of my life. Let me be innocent. Let me be blameless. And so when God's word convicts us, we should, we should take that seriously. And then understanding who God is and what he's revealed, along with understanding our own inadequacy, David finishes with this amazing last prayer where he says, not only don't let me sin, Lord, but let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And, and I hope that's your desire, Kendall, that not only our actions would be righteous, but our words and what goes on in our heart. Because what goes on in our heart is what's going to drive what we say and do.
Proverbs says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And our words are going to reflect our heart. And so does our heart, is it filled with love, contentment, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all of those things? Or is it filled with anger and discontentment and jealousy and pride and unthankfulness? That's what, that's what David's talking about. And, and that seems really hard. Like, how do I change how I think and who I am inside? That's a high bar. I can't do that on my own. That's impossible. But through Jesus Christ, he can transform our heart. He can transform our mind. He can take our heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. And he will do that if you ask him. Let's pray. Lord, we do just thank you for your word. We thank you for this psalm, Lord, this amazing poem or song or whatever it is that talks about you, God. You are an awesome God. You are an amazing God. You've revealed yourself, Lord. We so thank you for revealing yourself. God, help us. Help us. Lord, if people, do, someone here doesn't know you, Lord, I pray that they would turn to you, that you would, that you would renew their hearts. You'd bring them to life spiritually, Lord. For those of us who do know, Lord, let the meditations of our heart, the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing to you, God. That's our desire, Lord. Help us to do that. God, we love you and thank you that you make that possible. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks, everybody, for coming. It was great to have you here.